Good afternoon. This is Jeremy. It's Friday, May the 8th. Uh, we're still in lockdown in Toronto. Things are loosening up a little bit. Some of the stores are opening today and hopefully it'll be a nice weekend I can get out on my bike. Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, 64 QAM, 64 level quadrature am amplitude modulation. This is a technique that's part and parcel of uh, OFDM, which is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. As you know, over the years, uh, engineers are trying to get more uh, bang for the buck. They're trying to get more bits into a restricted bandwidth. So they're coming up with various schemes to do that. I first ran into OFDM uh, in connection with digital shortwave broadcasting. There's a system called DRM, and it uses OFDM. OFDM is also common in uh, cellular networks like 4, um, 4G, 5G, and LTE and it's used on cable systems. In fact, it's ubiquitous. Uh, you can find it pretty well everywhere. The idea of OFDM is that you take your data stream and you split it between um, quite a few different carriers that are separated with a particular type of separation. And each one of these carriers is modulated with a particular uh, scheme. Uh, and, and the scheme that we're gonna look at today is 64 QAM. In the new systems like LTE uh, and 5G, um, the carrier uses um, either QPSK or a, a type of a QAM modulation, for instance, 3264 or uh, perhaps higher uh, QAM. So let's look at, here's the blog post for 64 QAM, and uh, there's a screenshot of the constellation diagram. Each one of these points represents um, six bits. 64 is a 2 to the power 6. So in every symbol that's transmitted, it'll represent 6 bits. So this point is a particular combination of 6 bits. This is another combination of 6 bits. So um, all these 64 points represent every combination of the 6 bits. So here's one way of looking at how to construct um, 64 QAM. Let's imagine there's four constellations. And on the x-axis, we have I, the in-phase cosine omega CT. And in the y, uh, on the y-axis, we have Q, which is sine omega CT. And the various amplitudes of an I of Q, in the uh, I direction, we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4. We're going to have four different possible amplitudes. Of course, uh, in quadrant 2, we could have minus those values. And then in the positive direction on the quadrature side, we've got four different amplitudes for B. Um, so for instance, let's say this point here, this point represents six bits, but we can construct it of a, with a vector of A3, this amplitude A3 times cosine omega CT, and this amplitude B4 times sine omega CT. So here would be the equation, our QAM will be the amplitude along the i-axis times cosine omega ct, which in this case is a3, plus the amplitude along the quadrature axis, which will be v, b4 times sine omega ct. So there's eight different possibilities for amplitude for i, and there's eight different possibilities for amplitude for q in this kind of way of constructing uh, QAM. There's different ways that you can build a QAM uh, structure, but this is the one I'm using. Now, in terms of simulation, uh, let's look at a Psycos diagram that we use to simulate it. And here are the parameters that I'm going to use. I'm just going to pick for simplicity. I'm going to use a carrier frequency of 1000 hertz. Typically, these frequencies would be much bigger. Uh, but for, uh, for simplicity, I'm just picking 1000 hertz. Again, the number of levels will be 2 to the 6th, which is 64. 6 is the number of bits per baud or symbol. My bit rate is going to be 800 bits per second. The baud rate will be a sixth of that, or 133.3 baud's. The time per baud is going to be 7.5 milliseconds. Now we're going to see in the spectrum that our first null bandwidth is uh, our carrier plus the baud rate, or 130 plus or minus 133.3 hertz. If I didn't go to a multi-level modulation system, what would happen is that the first carrier null would be all the way out at R or six times greater. So essentially by going to six bits per baud, I've reduced my required bandwidth by a factor of six. Okay, so there's the model we're gonna use and let's go to it now. Here's my um, 
Side Coast model. Let's let me pull it up here. All right. And what we've got here, the way I've built it is I'm using, there's a block in the ModNum toolbox called MQAM. It's a square QAM modulator building with A and the B, I and Q components. So I'm going to feed it with a random integer generator. And this generator is going to have states from 0 to 63. So that's 64 possibilities. And then when you put that random in integer into here, this gives you the various um, plus or minus I values and the various plus or minus Q values. So there'll be a possible eight possible combinations of I and eight possible combinations of Q, just as we, we showed. And then we multiply them by sine and uh, sorry by cosine and sine and we add them together and we get our output so when I run the simulation let's look at now this shows you the output of the random number generator so if I expand that so there's my first uh, digit coming out of the random energy generator is 41 it lasts for 7.5 milliseconds and there's the next one it's 50 and then that one looks like it's around 10, etc. So those are the various uh, random integers coming out of the generator. And then that gives rise to these, which are your I and Q values. Remember we said we had eight possible I values and eight possible Q values. So let's say this is I. So the first one corresponding to the first random integer. This is, again, 7.5 uh, milliseconds long. This would be, um, let's see. this looks like minus 5, and it occurs twice, minus 5, minus 5. Down here, uh, it's 3. So the first pair of values was minus 5 and 3. The next pair of values was minus 5, and that looks like 5. So those are your I and Q. And then if we look over here, that's your QAM output. So if I expand that a little bit, Okay, so every one of these bursts is 7.5 milliseconds long, and it'll have a particular amplitude. Now, this amplitude will be the, um, the vector component of I and Q. So I squared plus Q squared square root, that'll be that amplitude. And the phase will be the tangent of Q over I. So you can see at every uh, baud interval, you get a different amplitude and you get a phase hit as well. If you look at this... Um, this particular waveform. This is not um, a great waveform for, for um, amplification. So if you've got to go through an RF amplifier, this is actually a horrible waveform to put through an RF amplifier because the amplifier has to be extremely linear because you've got so many uh, levels here. The power is varying all over the place. So you've got to have an extremely linear amplifier. And as well, if, for instance, we're going through um, some sort of frequency translation if we're going through let's say a, a super heterodyne process if you get a phase hit uh, there's a big probability that you're going to make an error if i go back to the um, let's go back to the diagram here the construction diagram notice that between these points uh, there's only a, like a seven degree uh, phase difference between this point and this point so if somehow the oscillator in some sort of frequency translation system takes a phase hit it could very easily uh, be greater than seven uh, seven point eight degrees so you'll get an error there okay so finally uh, finally let's look at the spectrum so let's magnify this a little bit uh, so there's the spectrum carrier frequencies at a thousand Hertz so my first null here is at a thousand Hertz plus the baud rate 133.3 Okay, so that's your uh, 64 QAM. Now let's compare this. So in my blog post here, what I've done is I've discussed what happens when you compare this uh, against a two-level system. So here I've got a simple two-level system instead of a 64-level system. And uh, I, I see that my first null bandwidth is 800 hertz now. So it'll be one uh, kilohertz plus 800 hertz. So it's it's six times bigger than the multi-level system. So let's quickly look at that. Let's open my model here and let's open the two-level. Uh, okay, so there's my simple two-level system. I've got a PN sequence generator now. It's not a, it's not an integer generator. It's just a 
a plus minus one. So plus one will be a one and minus one will be a zero. So it's just a data generator going into uh, cos multiplying cosine omega t. So it's just a two level system. So if I run that, Uh, we can see the difference. So let's just look at this. This is the, I'll just expand that out. So that's my PRBS signal. So it's, um, let's say it's, it, each baud interval is the same as before, but now we don't have a multi-level system. So it's just the bit rate is um, 800, uh, 800 bits per second. So each bit is one over that. So slightly, so it's 6.5 milliseconds divided by six. So slightly over one millisecond. So there's my data down there. This multiplies that. So basically I get a two level system and every time I get a change from a minus one to a one, I get a 180 degree phase hit. But the most important thing to notice here is the spectrum. So if we look at the spectrum now, so there's my carrier at one kilohertz. Now previously I saw my first null at, at uh, the carrier plus 133.3 uh, hertz. Now it's 100 plus um, 800. So you see we need much more bandwidth for the two-level system. So then the whole point of going to the multi-level system is you take this null and you move it in by a factor of six, which was the um, number of bits in a baud. Okay, so that's... Um, that's my comparison with a two-level system. Now, what we can do for um, transmission, to look at the transmission, what I'm gonna do now is I've got a model where I've got the transmitter that we just built and I'm going into a receiver here. So let's open that up. And what we're gonna do is we're going to simulate a link. So there's my complete channel. So what I've got here is I've got the transmitter that we just built and then I'm feeding that into, uh, this is my channel here, I'm adding random noise. And then what I'm doing is I've regenerated the two carriers. We need to regenerate by some process, I'm not showing that here, but there's a process called carrier regeneration or clock recovery. So I'm getting back the cosine and sine waveforms. So I'm multiplying my input stream with those particular waveforms. And what I'm doing is I'm going into um, a comparator and there'll be noise in these waveforms and with a comparator what I'm going to do is I'm going to regenerate my original data and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at an eye diagram uh, which is down here let's see where's the eye diagram there's my eye diagram and then I'm going to look at the bit errors so as you in the receiver as you uh, increase the noise here there's the noise source. As I increase the noise source, what happens is when you look at the eye diagram, the eye diagram looks at the tip of the received vector. So if you imagine I and Q added together to give you a composite vector, it's looking at the tip here. So this represents kind of the, the noise on the tip. So as you add more noise, what happens is the tip starts to fill out like that. Now the problem is with QAM, is that as you add more noise, notice now that there's a blur between these two particular states. So the more noise you add, there's a high probability that instead of this particular constellation point being chosen and those six bits, that you might have the receiver may make an error and get this particular site here with those six bits, or particular this one or that one. Well, this one's further away. so. Um, the, the chances are it's the closest neighbors that you'll make a mistake with. So this blurge, uh, merges with that, you might get that one instead, or this one, or that one. So that's what happens with QAM. Now, of course, as we discussed earlier, if there's a phase hit caused by, let's say, frequency translation, or perhaps even by a reflection or something like that, then l let's say that vector could easily swing either way. So that's another problem with QAM. Let's go back to the model here and see if it's filling out. These things take a time to, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. So there's my noisy I and Q. So that's like the I and Q waveforms we saw before, but look at all the noise sitting on top. Uh, and that's what we have to uh, feed into the comparator 
you know, this is the level that you want, but notice that the noise spikes on there. So you actually have to f um, go into a comparator and sample that, or you can you can do a match receiver type of thing and integrate that to get rid of that. So those are the noisy I and Q um, legs that you have to clean up to uh, reconstruct your signal. Okay, now the last thing we want to do, let's just close that, and actually um, import them into a function generator and create the waveform if I want to do lab testing with hardware. So let's look at that. So I've got my uh, trusty picoscope here. So here's my picoscope. And what I'm doing is those are my input, inputs A and B. Uh, here I have an external trigger and this is my signal generator output. So I'm going to load the CSV file into this and it's going to create a 64 QAM hardware electronic output and I'm just going to take it from the generator output and feed it into the receiver. So let's look at that. That's a very useful feature. So you can literally build anything and then get your function generator to transmit it. So there's my picoscope. Okay, so let's look at, um, here's the button for the signal generator and I'll go into the arbitrary uh, generator and I'm going to import a CSV file and let's see, I've got it. Where am I hiding it? I'm hiding it. There we go, it should be in there. So 64 QAM AWG. So there it is. So there's my 64 QAM. You can see all the various levels. And all I do here is I say apply. Okay. Signal on and bang. there. Let me do one more thing. I forgot, forgot to do one thing. Oh, yeah. In terms of the start frequency, now remember we, we ran it for two seconds. So that's a frequency of 0 0.5 hertz. So I have to repeat this every 0 0.5 hertz. So let me put that in there. There we go. So let's do a one shot. And let's go to, let's say, 50 milliseconds. So there we go. So there's my 64 QAM signal coming out of my hardware. So this, uh, like I said before, this is a very useful feature. So anything in the lab you build in, uh, let's say, Psychos, any software you build, you can, you can have your hardware transmitting that if you want to do testing. So that's our demo of 64 QAM.